Welcome to the Citizens Report. It's the 19th of February. I'm Robert Barwick, and I'm joined today by Citizens Party founder and leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. Welcome back to Melbourne. Thank you. I got to skip lockdown. I'll tell you why in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so in this week's Citizens Report, overturn the Canberra chessboard and how a postal bank would transform Australia. Now, before we begin though, Craig, we have, we have an announcement. Um, our YouTube viewers will likely have already noticed this. We have a brand new documentary, and it's an actual documentary, not just talking heads, um, properly produced by our excellent production team here. It's called Taking on the Banks, the truth about the Australia Post Cartier Watches Affair, which we're going to do an update on today about the campaign we're on. But this documentary lays it all bare. It tells it from beginning to end. It covers the, uh, we've just put out a press release which says it will infuriate you when you see just how corrupt and dirty Australian politics is, but also inspire you because it explains um, that this banking option, the win-win the solution of a postal bank, which Christine Holgate proved Australia Post is ideally suited to be, right, can transform Australia. And it, it, it exposes Scott Morrison's relationship with the banks, um, the, the disaster Australia Post was before she got in there, etc., cetera, and, and gives you the context why people like us were instantly suspicious when we saw that attack on her in Parliament back in October last year and why we got involved in this. Yeah, it brings it um, all together, right? I mean, it, it brings all these elements that you keep, people keep watching this campaign of ours and yeah. brings it all together in one place and, and it is exceptionally powerful. No, exactly. Yeah. So we, we, we cannot recap everything every time we do a show. Yeah. Right? We, hope, we, we just hope people have been um, following it along. If you're new to this, watch that documentary. But don't just watch it. We need you to watch it and share it as widely as possible and with your members of parliament. We'll talk about that more in a second. Now let's get on to today's show. Overturn the Canberra chessboard. And yes, I did skip lockdown because I went to Canberra last week. I had to go two days early because Melbourne went into lockdown and we had till midnight to get out or else we'd have to isolate in Canberra. So I got a flight and got up there because we'd planned all these meetings. And I was there with um, Angela Cramp of the Licensed Post Office Group. And we'll play a little clip later of Angela and I in, in Parliament House giving you an update. Um, but it was a brilliant week. I mean, I've, people who know the Citizens Party and me know I've, I do this quite a bit um, and, uh, over the last three years. And in fact, Craig, this, this week was the third anniversary of that infamous first one around the bail-in law, yeah. right? This is the third anniversary of the, of the Valentine's Day massacre of democracy when they ran through bail-in. Um, so I've been, yeah, I've, I've been very active in Canberra all that time. Haven't been for 12 months because of the, the, uh, the pandemic um, disruption, but I was back. Now, what we found though, the reason I'm calling this overturn the Canberra chessboard is members of parliament think of politics like a game of chess. And they're thinking politically moves you know, many moves in, a, in advance, right? This sort of thing. Um, and when you're in that room, that building, that, the, the Canberra bubble, right? It would seem all important to them, right? Who's, who's down the hall that I need to be allying with or, or tacking or all that kind of stuff, right? And a lot of it, that, that's how they think. And that doesn't mean they're bad people. Some are, some are bad people, some are very good people, but that's how they think. This is real life. It's not a game of chess, right? And what happens is when we come along representing the real life needs of the public on matters of fundamental importance because it affects their lives, that's how you've got to think of it. We are overturning that chessboard. Because when you're having these discussions with politicians, they're thinking, you know, you, you know they, they mean well and they're going, oh, this, this, most of them are saying, oh, you, it won't, you won't be able to get Christine Holgate reinstated, right? And then when we got through to them, just how much the backlash is growing here that we represented, it overturned the chessboard in their mind. And suddenly, lots of things are possible. Yeah, you, you took to Canberra the fact that right, we talked to 500 to 1,000 people a week directly on the phone from our team. And we get the direct feedback of what people are actually yes. thinking. And it's not necessarily what the politicians get, except when they call, our members and uh, activists call the MPs. Well, you know, they assumed in this case that the Australian public would think, oh, some fat cat CEO spent money on silver watches or whatever, stuff her. And of course, people did think that when they first heard about it. But the minute they heard there's another side, 
everyone's knew, aha, we knew there had to be another side because that we, they, they don't need to be convinced how dirty politicians are, mm. right? And, and then we were reflecting the, the, the genuine backlash that's out there. So there were some specifics though that made a difference. And one of those specifics is we got through to them the fact that Christine Holgate has not resigned. Because the government, the government has tried to bluff this. They, they, they um, misrepresented her standing aside. They misrepresented her resigning. And they assumed she would go away and the licensed post offices would go away and the public wouldn't care because it was over fancy watches, right? And now they've got a problem because Christine Holgate is standing firm with the licensed post offices. They're 100% loyal to her. And the public that's learning what happened here and the bigger issue relating to the banks is getting behind this. And they've, they've, they've actually got a, a, a they, they understand they've got a political problem that they have to address. Um, my presence helped, I must say. Angela Cramp is an excellent spokesperson for the, for the licensed post offices. She is, she is she's one of my new heroes. Right, she, what she's gone through to represent her group over many years um, and through difficult, difficult times, they were, they were second class citizens in Australia Post. No, none of the management, none of the government cared they were going bankrupt all those years. So when Christine Holgate changed that, right, um, first of all, hats off to Angela for surviving all those years and then knowing that no one's going to convince her that Christine Holgate was not the best thing that ever happened to that organisation. And so she's now putting, marshalling all their troops to say, no, we're going to fight for this person to be restored, right? So they got that. My presence as the Citizens Party is, listen, buddy, um, you, you're a National Party MP or a Liberal Party MP, et cetera. You, your constituents rely on these post offices, right? And they will get behind, when they hear about this, they'll get behind the political people who champion them. And I'm here, you've got a political problem. And they got that too, mm. right? So that was good. But anyway, um, I want to show you a clip. This clip personifies what we achieved last week in Parliament. Now, one of the first MPs to take this up and, and really champion this was Bob Catter. Bob Catter on these kind of issues and banking issues is the greatest man in Parliament. He's now the father of the House, um, which means he's the longest serving member of Parliament. He's an independent because he will not, he never wanted, he never went along with the corrupt deals the major parties got into over economic policy, etc. And now, of course, politics is coming more around to, to his way of thinking. He got this. He did some media stuff with Christine that hopefully we'll be able to highlight um, next week. But he decided he wasn't going to let the government get away with continually bluffing on this. So, I'll tell you, so what happened was yesterday in question time, the Minister for Communications, Paul Fletcher, who is one of the people that shafted Christine Holgate, he gets up there and this subject came up because NBN was reported to have given big bonuses as well. He drew a comparison to Christine Holgate and he said in passing that she had resigned. Bob Catter wasn't even in the chamber, Craig. And when he heard that, he grabbed his suit coat, running down the hall as he's putting it on, ran to the chamber and did this. Significant issue of market power in the market for the, digital advertising. The Minister will resume his seat. The member for Kennedy on a point of order. Uh, Mr Speaker, if a person knows that a person, a minister is lying, is it my duty to stand up and say that he's lying? Christine Holgate never resigned. The member, now, don't tell lies the... to the House. There you go. <laughs> now, Craig, it's unparliamentary to use the word lie. Hmm. Bob knows that. He's been there longer than all the rest of them. He broke all the he knew which rules to break to get his message across, right? Every single member of parliament now knows, if they didn't know before, they now know emphatically she did not resign. That has been a lie all along. And if and she did not resign, and she's been cleared by the inquiry, she can be reinstated. And you saw Scott Morrison and Albo swing around <laughs> on their chairs to look at Bob Catter. They heard him point Exactly, back. exactly. All right, let's take a break and then we'll report from Canberra a situation report. Welcome back to the Citizens Report. Now I want to play you a clip from Canberra that Angela Cramp and I recorded yesterday at the end of our week of meetings and where you'll get to hear from Angela firsthand the, what, um, how, how it went for her and you'll get to see some of the Canberra scenery as we're talking. Hello, it's Robert Barwick and Angela Cramp. I'm from the Citizens Party. Angela's from the Licensed Post Office Group. We're talking to you from inside the, one of the courtyards of Parliament House at the end of our week 
that we've spent here meeting members of parliament to tell them to reinstate Christine Holgate. So Angela, you've had a lot of experience in this building I've discovered. <laughs> what do you think of the reception we've received? I think everyone was pretty positive. Obviously they all have their own particular bent on the issue. Whether it, uh, look, but they don't argue much, with the facts, do they? No, no, not many people think it's anything to do with watches. No, that's that right. may well have been the optics that they all responded to, but the vast majority have been very dismissive of the cause. Yep. But they have certainly agreed that it ballooned into a monster that nobody quite knows how to tame. Yeah. So, what? Yeah. Because I'm not from a licensed post office. Um, I've been a able to watch post community office. post office. I've been able to watch politicians actually see it through Angela's eyes and the eyes of 3,000 community post offices, and it's quite remarkable that the way that they finally understand how significant Christine Holgate was to this business. So, what we need to do is get that message to all politicians. This is not over by any means. Um, there are initiatives underway behind the scenes now that we're satisfied. There are some highly motivated members of parliament that want this addressed. And um, we need the public, though, to get involved. This is a much bigger issue than Christine. Christine is significant because she was the first CEO to make Australia Post work properly, right? That's right. And the way she did it is by making financial services... Uh, Available. Available and properly compensated yeah. by the banks. Yeah. And that's all at risk now, right? So if we want Australia Post, if you want your post office to stay in public hands, um, we have to tell the government what they did was unacceptable here. They need to rectify the situation. And that there's, there's multiple ways they can do it. But the number one way is to reinstate Christine Holgate. Yeah. To restore the leadership of Australia Post, as we have experienced for the last three years. Right? We yeah. know the difference. We've got money in our banks and we have confidence in our business model. And if this is allowed to be the new game where somebody swipes a pen and, and the leadership of this institution is removed for no just cause, then that makes all of us yep. very insecure and our future very insecure. And after the last three years where we all felt we had seen the light up the end of the tunnel was not the train, it was actually blue sky and sunshine. We want that back. And the way for that to come back into our lives is that the government, the minister and the board of Australia Post is accountable to every one of us. There's more than 80,000 of us that really make this business work. And it should not be up to somebody's rant or somebody's yep. just light bulb moment that puts in jeopardy the security, the confidence and the future of this icon. Australia Post will outlive this government and the next government and governments to come. It should be run well, it should be accountable to the people below, not the people above. Exactly. And given that Christine Holgate was the first CEO in 40 years to actually make that work. And what was done to her was wrong. It was based on dishonest information and she's been cleared. Tell your politicians stuff the way they think about politics, right, of the optics and all this kind of stuff. What was done was wrong and they should reinstate it. So we need everyone calling politicians about this because you're not just defending Christine, you're defending the whole of our, our public postal office. And if we do that and, and stop and it being privatised, yeah, we can turn it into a bank. We're calling, we're calling for a successful Australia Post under a successful, a proven successful leader. We're in a period of transition. This business needs to reform to meet the future. And we do not, like many of us that have been around for the last 15 years have already been through one reform uh, leadership and all we did was change the colours of the trucks and go round and round in circles. We want somebody who's actually got a vision that will make this business work. We saw it. Yep. It was part of our future and we want it back. Alright, so we've had fun. Goodbye from Parliament House. Okay. So thank you to our Canberra correspondents there. <laughs> Alright, now one last thing before we finish this segment, Craig. Um, 
it's very important. Everybody watching this, finish watching this, and if it's a weekday, even if it's a weekend, find your local member of parliament and call them and say, reinstate Christine Holgate. Get a copy of the video that we just put up, the documentary, and send them that link and say, you've got to watch this and you should reinstate Christine Holgate. If you call them on the weekend, leave a message on their answer machine. Otherwise, call them on Monday's first thing. Certain things will be done in Parliament next week on this issue. We need them to be getting a flood of calls while they're in there in Parliament, right? So go to the link and um, look up your local member of Parliament and get their Canberra number and say, you must reinstate Christine Holgate. So they know there is feeling out there. There are people who are onto this, right? And they have a political problem and need to do something about it. So let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to spend a bit of time actually describing in detail why we need a postal bank and how our proposal for one will work. Welcome back to the Citizens Report. So this episode is called How a Postal Bank Would Transform Australia, this segment, sorry. And I'm going to let Craig do most of the talking this time, but but let me preface it because I've got to say something. Um, in the in our meetings this week in Canberra, we talked to them about the specifics of the Christine Holgate issue, Australia Post issue. We also talked to everybody about a postal bank, and I carry with us the Citizens Party's draft legislation for a postal bank. Craig, I was blown away. Now you've done, you know, we've been doing this for years. We've been going into Parliament House for decades talking about we need a national bank, this, this sort of thing. What I found on this issue was emphatic, not casual, emphatic acceptance and support from a Labor politician, a Liberal politician, and a national politician, and, and a lot more. But those three, right, representing the major parties, that's, that's what's unusual, emphatic. And in fact, the Liberal, let me quote the Liberal, which was the most surprising, he said, in response to this, he said, um, the paradigm of how we have run the economy for the last 30 years has failed. We need a new way of doing things. That's why he supported the proposal. And that's what we say. So, Craig, we've in, that, in this week's issue of the, our weekly magazine, Australian Alert Service, which you can call in and get a free copy of if you haven't before, we published the explanatory memorandum of our bill for a Commonwealth Postal Savings Bank. So just go through the elements of how that would work, starting with why it's necessary and then how the proposal would work. Well, Robbie, you know, I think all the politicians in Canberra are well aware of the Royal Commission to Banking, of course, and the fact is that no, no bankers went to jail. The, the, all the criminal nature of what the banks, the private banking system were doing was, has never been addressed and it's still not addressed. The problem in our country is that the four major banks have 80% of the um, financial system. Yeah. That, that's the reality. Enormous right? concentration. And this undermines competition. In fact, I, I found this wonderful quote that's been published in the Alert Service from Rod Sims, the, uh, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission chairman, who said on, uh, in, a, in, a, in an event with the Australian Financial Review in April 2018, he says the behaviour of the major banks <laughs> yeah. more resembles synchronised swimming than any than it does vigorous competition. Yeah. Right. So look, we're talking about a system of vertically integrated banks. You know, conglomerates of commercial banking, investment banking, stockbroking, insurance, superannuation, and the works. And the problem is, this is very high risk activity that ordinary depositors that go to the bank and put their money in are sucked up in. Yep. They've got no choice. Yep. Right. So, um, and. This is a dangerous situation. We've reported it many, many, for many, many times over many years now on the danger of derivatives in particular. Well, they're hanging over our head just like they're hanging over banks around the world that have actually gone under because of them. Yeah, and I, we, we always talk about the, the problem with the private banking system is they put their profit ahead of services. Yeah. And this is what Ben Chifley back in the 1930s pointed out. We needed to nationalise the banks. We needed a national bank in order to control, and just and control the process. But just have a look what they did in 2018. They closed... 196 branches and 734 ATMs, and that's accelerated to this point. So the private banks are maximising profit to the to the detriment of the services to the community. They're shutting down regional branches in, in in country towns and so forth. And that's actually what the problem that Christa Hol Christ Christine Holgate intersected. Is that it increased all these pressures on the private uh, yeah. the postal banks, uh, the post post offices because people were coming in to do their yeah, banking. Yeah, but the local branch would, bank branch would shut down. Those people could only go to the post office and the queues at the post office got larger and larger and larger. 
the post offices had to put on more workers to serve the, and they're getting no extra money back from the banks for it. Yeah. And that's what Christine Holgate changed. She made the banks pay for them servicing their customers and it worked really well, right? But the banks don't like the fact they've had to pay we, for something they got for free. Yeah, we highlighted that in that doco, Robbie, which is really, there's some really moving scenes in there about just how destructive this was. Yeah. But the, look at the other criminal behaviour that the banks are into. They're into debanking legitimate Australian businesses. Businesses that, that uh, abide by the Austrac yeah, money laundering totally provisions. Totally lawful businesses. Right, legitimate businesses under pay all their bills and so forth, but the banks say, no, you're, you, you represent a threat to us. We're going to withdraw our banking services. And because they're you. private businesses, they can. Yeah. It's up, it's up to the bank. You can't force a private business to do business with someone that doesn't want to. And, of course, the other issue that we've been very vocal and actually beat them on this time around was the that the major banks are promoting this cash, cashless yeah. payment system minimising the use of cash and so forth. Now, this doesn't do anything to support the economy or people. So this is where the Australian Post Bank comes in. It's completely different. Now, this is going to be a public institution. We've written the legislation for this. People can get a copy if they want to call in and get it. But it's going to be a public institution dedicated to the economic pr prosperity and welfare of the people of Australia. So it's not about profit. It's no. about developing the physical economy. It's going to promote genuine competition in the banking system because that's what Chifley said back in the 30s was needed. You can't keep these bastards honest unless you've got something to, to, to keep them honest with. This is what Curtin and Chifley did during the war with the Commonwealth Bank. They used the regulations with the Commonwealth Bank to keep the private banks under control and so that they wouldn't profiteer from the shortages of the war. And Craig, even though the Commonwealth Bank in the post-war decades was a, was, was a shell of how powerful it had been in the war, it was still a public competitor to the private banks. And you look at the massive profits that we've become used to by private banks in our era of billions and billions. That all started when the Commonwealth Bank was privatised in 1996. Yeah. So the post bank will be you know, in the local post offices. It's going to be there to provide the basic deposit and financial services required for all Australians, separated out from the financial risks that come uh, in, from investment banking and all sorts of things like that. It's also governed, guaranteed by the government, Robbie. Everyone's deposit's guaranteed because it's yes. a government-owned institution. So when people say, what do I do with my money? You help us fight for a postal bank so you know that you can put your money in there and it'll be 100% safe. Yeah, and, and the, uh, it, it actually ensures, because it's dedicated to services, it ensures that rural and regional communities actually have access to banking. Uh, it means that low-income metropolitan areas where the banks have withdrawn because they say, oh, it's not profitable for, for us to be here, people have an opportunity to go and participate in the banking system. And if you have a look at this graph that we've got in our alert service, you know, this shows the number of Australia boat, uh, bank uh, uh, outlets that are further than 50 kilometres from the nearest bank branch. And, it's and, that's, and that, look, look at the distribution on that map. Private banks would never do that. For that, that is Australia Post Network. It's first and foremost a service. And that's what would make it perfect to be a bank. Yep. And a publicly owned, government owned bank cannot discriminate against lawful businesses. So people, you know, they can't do what the private banks are doing because they're not private. They're publicly owned. They're publicly there to represent the laws of the nation. And if people are lawful in their activities, they can participate in the banking system. And that's very important, Craig. You, yeah, so that any lawful business knows that that's the government one that they can do that. And cash is the other uh, issue. Yep. Now listen, we're going to have to, we're going to, we're going to say goodbye to our Channel 31 viewers. Um, so get involved though, Channel 31. You can go onto YouTube and watch what we're going to do now because we're going to go through how our proposal will specifically work in terms of structure. So thanks for tuning in and we'll keep going with YouTube viewers. So now we want to talk about the structure of our proposal, which we call the Commonwealth Postal Savings Bank, which we've put in legislative form. Because the structure is, is um, there's, there's, there's various models you could use. This is the one we've chosen. And we'll, we'll, um, we'll see what sort of feedback we get, etc. But So Craig, let's go through the details. What, what are we looking at? Robbie, this is a brand new national corporation which we'll establish. Not brand new in idea because it more, it's going to emulate what was done uh, with the 1912 version of the Commonwealth Bank. And it's going to be working alongside Australian post offices. In other words, the branches of the bank will be in the post offices. Now, just quickly, that means, and people will be clear on this, we're not talking about Australia Post, the corporation, getting a banking licence. That's right. right. We're talking about a new public corporation that is a bank 
that exists entirely to function within the post offices. Right? So the Australia Post can still function as primarily a postal service, but they will have this extra uh, facility which they will be the agents for. But, Robbie, it's really important that the bank would then compensate Australia Post for yes. being an agent of its financial services. And, you know, so, and there's various things about this because unlike the current bank at post arrangements with the private banks, this would be a permanent arrangement, legislated yes. as a permanent arrangement, um, which is not the case with the current uh, No, right now, post. the private banks could say, yeah, like the ones who did this deal in 2018, they did a deal because they, saw, they thought, okay, that is worthwhile for us. But any moment they could say, okay, no, no, we, we don't see the value in it for us anymore. And if they all decide that, Australia Post is back to where it started, right? And, what, and one of the things we're trying to achieve here is not just a bank, a public bank, but we also need a postal service. And the problem is around the world, Craig, postal services have had hard going because of technology. People are sending less mail. So the model that, that Christine Holgate saw and has worked in other countries is combine the two so that the financial services subsidise the postal services and this is what our proposal would do. And it's important, Robbie, that we protect this infrastructure, this Australia Post infrastructure. Therefore, the bank would have to pay Australia Post yes. the actual cost yes. of servicing its customers, not a dollar thirty-eight for 20 minutes work, no. as you'll see in the doc. I mean, that's yeah. disgusting. And, yeah. and this is what... You, know, you get away from the situation where the post office became in effect, subsidising entire communities for banking services because, and, and they were going broke. Yep. Right. So that's very, very important, and because this can, it will secure this arrangement with this, the the bank will will secure Australia Post a permanent source of external revenue, so they can maintain a, yep. a very vibrant, um, guaranteed. And the licensed post, post office's office. viability will remain secured forever. And then when you're in the regional areas, Robbie, where the banks have all pulled out you'll have the bank providing um, and meeting the demand for face-to-face -face banking. Um, you know, because most of the private banks have pulled out, you know, as, again... I'll tell you what, even politicians, Craig, I, some of them I met, you know, they, they were so glibly said, yeah, but we're all moving to internet banking. Well, even if that's true, you know, that's not actually true. There's a whole segment, especially elderly people, etc., who aren't interested in that. It's too hard. But in rural Australia, are you going to have NBN Central Melbourne quality internet all around Australia? No, you don't, right? And so there will always be, well, let the government wheel that out, roll that out, right? Pay for that. But in the meantime, people need to know that they should be confident in their banking. Face to face is what makes them confident, and that's why this, these offices will do an excellent yeah, A lot of trade. people say, Robbie, oh, they'll just put an ATM in our town. No, they won't, because no. ATMs cost a lot of money yep. to service, right? So. The, the, the bank's going to guarantee retail banking for people, right? The other thing is, because the post offices already exist, it doesn't have to build expensive post uh, you know, yes. bank branches. It can use the existing uh, infrastructure um, of the Australia Post, meaning they can be anywhere there's an Australia Post branch. Uh, but the really interesting uh, thing that people be concerned about, we get a lot of our supporters calling in about this because they're worried about their money. This would come with, this bank would come with a full guarantee for deposits, not just the financial claim scheme that will guarantee deposits up to 250000 but all of your deposits. Yes. And this is a very, very, very important aspect of our bank. It also provides credit to communities uh, uh, that are having difficulty getting credit because of the profit-based motives of the private banking system to, to issue credit. So the, the Commonwealth uh, uh, Postal Savings Bank would make loans to individuals, to businesses, including farms, right, and also to local government for infrastructure. And it won't do that in the postal bank, uh, post office branches. The initial loan applications will be handled by, and of course they'll be compensated office, yep. by, by the bank for doing that, but then the actual loan application process will be done by expert staff at the bank, at the, 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 either the regional or the head offices. Yeah, there will be a way that the bank could interface with the post offices so the post offices could do the help, help with the paperwork. But you want, you want qualified banking experts to assess these loans, etc. However, with a, with a bias towards, look, get money out into local communities, into businesses, here assess them, make sure they can be repaid, but get away from this current system where those big four banks are only interested in one thing, Craig, and that's mortgages. And they'll throw $2 million at a 20-year-old couple in Perth or Gold Coast or whatever to buy an apartment, but they won't lend a cent to business people 
in regional Australia in perfectly productive, viable businesses because they're not interested in that. And it yeah. starves industry of credit. And there's no reason for that. This kind of bank will attract a lot of deposits. There will be enormous demand for those loans from that's why, regional Australia. That's why the private banking system, Robbie, is terrified about an Australian-owned postal bank because people are going to say, oh, great, my money can be guaranteed. I'll take my pension yeah. savings and I'll put it in that bank. Right, so it's going to attract a lot, a lot of money for investment, right? So that extra money or the money that's not needed, uh, that's there, can be used for investing in, you know, Commonwealth and state infrastructure projects, for example. And this really, uh, the, the background or the, what's also behind this, uh, this proposal of ours is that we've been, what we've been campaigning for the last 30 years, and that is the need for a government-owned national bank or, or a national infrastructure bank. Our idea is for a national bank, which is greater than just an infrastructure bank. But the point is that this is where deposits from the postal bank can be placed, all government guaranteed, and be then invested in the economic development of Australia. And that's the and that's the uh, that's similar to the Japan Post model, Craig, which actually didn't do any retail lending. It took in all these retail deposits and it lent those deposits to the government for their infrastructure budget and to dedicated. Uh, development banks for agriculture, for manufacturing, this sort of thing, right? And so experts in those dedicated institutions decided where it was lent out to. And, and so this was a, a wholesale lending that the Postal Bank did. That can be a function of this. Our proposal as well, for the, for the surplus deposits that aren't lent out at a retail level, they can put them all into the National Infrastructure Bank that we're also pushing. And Robert, you did a special show with Daisuke Kotagawa, yes. who was from the Ministry of Finance of Japan who goes through this in detail. That's available for people to watch too if they yep. want more details about this. But look, what does this mean, Rob? A, a postal bank owned and guaranteed by the Commonwealth, dedicated to increasing banking competition, to providing financial services to people all around the country, no matter where they live, right? Providing credit for neglected communities and farmers and so forth, promoting economic development and providing a safe alternative to the private banking system that's gorged itself with speculation. That's why the major a lot of members of the major parties, the nationals in particular, are very interested in this. Yep. Right. So that's why people have got to get on board with our campaigns. This is not just about saving, you know, reinstating Christian, Christ, Christine Holgate. She represents what the future is for our country in this area, because she's got the guts to fight for it. And by the if we win that part of it, right, and actually force them to back down and reinstate her, we are winning a we are winning a fight against pretty powerful vested interests. That's the same. That's the part and parcel of the same fight that's going to allow us to achieve this. That's why I said what I said at the beginning. I was really struck by the across the board support for this idea. That's been a shift, Craig. Mm. Twenty years ago, we had the same party saying to us. No, 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 the, you know, government shouldn't be involved in banking, etc. I had all the major parties this week telling me they should be, right? We, we, people like us and Bob Catter and whatever maintained the, the cause all those years, and now they've come, now they've come around. So this is a winner, and um, uh, get involved in the fight. Stick with us, get involved in the fight, because this is how you actually, um, you know, there's a lot of scary stuff out there politically, globally, etc. but this is how you win a fight back. Right? You identify the solutions and you fight for them. Yep. All right, Craig, thank you very much for all that. Excellent. I hope um, people learned a lot. And if you want more information, like I said, you can get a copy of this week's alert service. But otherwise, thanks for joining us on this extended uh, episode of the Citizens Report and join in next week for more.